All right, so we'll get started. Um, good evening. Today is uh, September 12, 2022. Thank you for joining us um, for in person in Contois Auditorium and online for the Burlington City Council meeting. The time is now 625, so we're running a little bit behind, but we're going to catch up. Um, we're going to begin our agenda this evening with a motion to adopt our agenda. Councillor Hightower. Move to adopt the agenda as listed on board docs. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. There's a motion. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Second. Uh, seconded by uh, uh, Councillor Shannon. Um, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say no. We have an agenda, which brings us to our next item, which is 2.01, which is a communication and expected executive session. Um, this is an update regarding collective bargaining with the BFFA, which is our, our fire union. Um, we do anticipate that this executive session will last approximately one hour. Um, and normally what we do is before there are motions to go into executive session, um, would turn to either council or the administration if you feel that there's anything that um, we can, any information we can give to the public at this time. And if there is, great. If not, if you could just indicate so. This is with respect to the executive session on yeah. the firefighter. I mean, it's generally um, the nature of the collective bargaining process is there's very little we can say about the um, uh, the bargaining until it's completed um, and um, this is the uh, maybe just the broader context we can share is that we have four unions we have completed the contracts for the, the um, other three unions uh, the fire Burlington firefighters association is the final mm -hmm. contract we've been um, in started this process a number of months ago um, the conversations have uh, accelerated recently when we've completed the other the other contracts, and uh, we're looking forward to briefing the council on on where those negotiations stand tonight. Wonderful, thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, with that, we'll go to the first. There are two motions to go into executive session. We'll go to the first of the two motions, and we'll look to Councilor Shannon. I move that the council find the premature general public knowledge of information concerning negotiations of labor relations. Agreements with employees would clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage with such negotiations. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Um, uh, seconded by Councillor McGee. Uh, all the, are there, is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, um, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, the motion passes, which brings us to the second motion, Councillor Shannon. Based upon that finding, I move that the council go into executive session to receive confidential updates on labor relations agreements with employees. Thank you, Councilor Shannon, seconded by Councilor McGee. And to this, um, and to that motion, it would also include the mayor's staff, attorney John Maitland, HR director, Karen Durfee, CAO Recording Catherine. Recording in progress. Oh, CAO Catherine Shad. Uh, City Attorney Jared Pellerin and Acting Fire Chief Libby. Um, with that, all those in favor, or is there any Recording discussion? in progress. Is there any discussion on that motion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say no. That motion passes and we would, we will move into executive session. We do that downstairs. And again, we expect to be back in open session, hopefully, um, by around 7.15. Um, might be a little bit later, but we're going to do our best. Thank you. Uh, so we're back in open session, and the next item on the agenda is 3.01, which is a work session on board docs and alternatives to uh, board docs. Um, for this work session, this was a priority that came out of the council retreat in May, and we're going to be receiving a presentation from our CIO, Scott Barker, um, but he is not here with us right now. So we were looking for, for Scott, who I believe is in the building, but not inside Contois. Um, so if we can just, we'll just wait for a minute. Someone had texted him to see if he um, is 
able to make it down here this time. And at this point, we are getting close to 7.30, um, so we may delay this presentation and then move on to the public forum. As the, as the time is now 7.26, uh, there are three people who are signed up to speak in public forum inside Contois, and there is one person uh, who has signed up to speak during public forum that is online. Um, given, given that, uh, just to keep us moving along, we'll, we'll hold off on item 3.01. Um, and move on to item 4.01, which is the public forum. Um, before we begin public forum, just a few items of information. The system on the table in front of us has three lights. A green light will shine when you start speaking, a second yellow light when you have 30 seconds left, and then the last uh, red light will shine when your time is up. We ask that you please complete your comments when the Sound indicates that your time is up, so everyone has the same amount of time to speak. Um, there's a hybrid system for public forum. Um, if you wish to speak, you can go online to burlingtonvt.gov slash public forum, and a, a form will come up, and then we'll populate that form, um, and we'll come into a spreadsheet that I can see, um, and then we'll be able to call on you in the order um, when you submit the form. As been our practice, Burlington residents will have first priority, and um, we will go to Burlington residents in Contois who have submitted a form in person, then Burlington residents online, then back to Contois for non-Burlington residents, and then back to online for non-Burlington residents. Um, the only request that we make is that you use respectful language when you speak during public forum, we're much more able to hear you and listen to you if you are respectful and would ask that you please not personalize your comments and direct them to me as the chair. Um, with that, we have uh, three people signed up uh, for public forum who are all Burlington residents that are in Contois. Uh, the first is Sharon McCarthy. Um, Sharon, please come forward, welcome. Uh, and uh, happy to hear your comments. And the next speaker will be Pike Porter after that. Oh, we didn't say that. You have two minutes. And please, if you could just make sure that the microphone is on, there's a green light that comes on right in front of you on the microphone. You just press where it says push. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. <clears throat> With all, uh, my name is Sharon, and um, I'm happy to be here. 
So with all due respect to all concerned, our city is suffering from a lot of the decisions that you have made in the last two years. We have become overrun with homelessness and drugs, gangs and random shootings, not to mention the crime and the theft that is rampant. These people are going rogue in every area of downtown. Defunding our police and decreasing the force was a fantastic error in your judgment. Burlington is now a city that is not being cared for and its citizens are suffering from your choices. <clears throat> Unruly people are setting up housing, tents, and squatting in public areas that used to be illegal and considered loitering. It was not allowed. We have a segment of the population being drawn here and they are going rogue because they know there is no oversight that is enforced. The sanitation situation alone is a problem. They use fountains and backyards as bathrooms. My backyard is one of them and trash is everywhere. They stay up until four and five in the morning, fighting and drinking at different locations. Pearl and Battery is one of them, keeping us up all night long with their ruckus. It's disturbing what is happening to the city. Let me be clear that I have a heart for the homeless, and I certainly feel that those of us who are more fortunate need to put in place a solution for those who cannot afford housing and we need to take care, but in an organized and productive way. Not like this, giving free reign to do whatever, wherever, However, one pleases without any rules and regulations in place. This used to be, as I said, loitering, and it was not allowed. <clears throat> we used to have a vibrant, beautiful city. No longer, the economy is suffering. Business, businesses are closing and people are leaving in droves. Because of the decline in safety and morale of our city servants, police, fire, ambulance, social workers, etc., we all need to work together with our police officers, not either or. Since when did the rights of the homeless override my rights as a tax-paying citizen? My taxes went from 6,000 to 10,000 this year, and I don't feel safe. You need to think about what you're doing. And you need to, uh, I mean, Thank you know, you. everything is, this city used to be thriving. Thank you, thanks so much. Uh, our next speaker is, uh, our next speaker is Pike Porter to be followed by um, Todd LaCroix. Good evening. I'm uh, here to just uh, emphasize the emails that I sent to you this weekend. Um, also to ask or to advise you that I don't believe that the lease, the beta technologies lease that will be in front of you today, has been approved, much less seen, by uh, the airport commission, which I understand is just really a symbolic position with no authority, but I would think there should be at least some uh, acknowledgement that they should have some role in uh, encumbering airport land for 40 or years or more. That said, in principle, I approve this lease. However, in practice, I have reservations, mainly because uh, uh, Nick Longo, the airport director, has identified a parcel uh, near Airport Parkway, near um, three parcels with eight units in it, all, re uh, all rentals where he says that this is the only location where a large new uh, airport maintenance facility can be uh, in installed. This doesn't seem right to me. It seems like if there's uh, room on the West Valley uh, for beta technologies, there should be room for an airport uh, maintenance facility so as not to further encumber, further um, harass the quality of life of the, the tenants, the eight families that are still living there on our parkway. Uh, so I think that's all I need to say. Uh, with regard to the um, rank choice voting, I uh, certainly approve. I don't think uh, anyone who's only received 40% of the popular vote should uh, be mayor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Todd LaCroix, to be followed by Robert Bristow Johnson, and then we will move to online. Quality, not quantity of police. That's the real problem. You guys are just talking about numbers and budgets, but you don't talk about the real issues. Let's talk about some real issues. There are more registered gun dealers in America than McDonald's, Wendy's, Burger King's, and Taco Bell's and Starbucks combined, okay, while all these restaurants have been independent going out of business. And most of them 
are ex-military and ex-people with badges selling these weapons. Now, 20 years of the war on terror, what is the result of this? As they promised to make us happier and safer, all they have done is managed to make everything worse. Let me give you the numbers. Right now, children are number one cause of death amongst our children is guns. More than 6,500 children aged up to 19 are shot and killed in the U.S. every year, and 1,500,000 are shot and wounded, and an average of 51 kids are dead a day. And the psychological impact goes deeper, with about 3 million witnessing it annually. This violence brought to us by men with badges and their for-profit prison systems and our dysfunctional parents who want to tell us, the children and the youth, that it's our fault when they have given us $30 trillion in debt for wars and police forces that treat us like we don't belong in our own towns, like we don't belong in our own families, like we don't belong, like we're Taliban. They hunt us. They put us in schools that are like prison systems, and then prison systems that are even worse. And then you wonder why everybody's so angry. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Bristow Johnson, and then we do have one person who has signed up online, and we will go to that person next. It's a hard act to follow. Um, so uh, this is about uh, redistricting and a map that you're looking at tonight. Uh, it says it's a seven ward, uh, 12 counselor map, but it's not really seven wards, it's actually five wards and two half wards. Now imagine you're in, on this map, either ward three or ward seven, let's say ward three. Uh, on the even numbered years, everybody in the city gets to vote for city council except you. How are you gonna feel about that? If you're on ward seven, on an odd numbered year, everybody in the city gets to weigh in on city council except you. Who wants to be in that ward? So, you know, we've heard some complaints about, well, these district councilors, they have to represent twice as much and they, they have twice the constitu constituency, but they get paid the same, they, they get the same vote and they get the same term, length of term. Those are four persons in this city, one one hundredth of one percent of the population of the city that are disadvantaged. But otherwise, every voter in the city is treated equally in the current 812 system. Um, so imagine you're in that 16%, that's, you know, wards three or seven, and um, what we get to tell the district councilors is, well, if you, if you don't like it, don't run for office. We don't have to do that. What are we going to tell these folks in wards three and seven? If you don't like it, don't vote. So um, I have a, even though I had something to do with the map, I have a fundamental problem with the notion of the uh, 712 map. I uh, just thought I'd tell you why. Thank you very much. We do have, we do have one person who has signed up online, a Burlington resident. Um, I uh, would leave it to you to just sort of find this person if you could, um, or if Aaron can, um, is uh, Bob Duncan. And then if you can enable that person's microphone.
You don't see that? Okay, we'll give them, we'll give them a minute. Hi, this is Aaron Stetzner. I'm currently looking for Bob Duncan in the attendees right now. I'm not seeing him, but I'm continuing to look. Okay, thank you. Okay, it appears as though uh, that person can't be located online. Um, with that, we'll close the public forum at 7.40 and return to item 3.01, which was the work session on board docs. Uh, and at the risk of repeating myself, uh, for this work session, this was a priority that came out of the council retreat in May. We'll have a presentation from our CIO, Scott Barker, um, and then we'll have time for questions from the council and a discussion on next steps um, in this process. Uh, CIO Barker, thank you so much for being with us this evening. You are welcome. Do you, I think everybody has the presentation in board docs. Do you need me to bring it up and throw it up on a screen? Uh, if, you, if, if we can, that would be great, yes. I don't know why not. Do you have it? You have it. Okay. You knew somebody in IT. Oh, there it is. All right. You can bounce to the first one. So when we started talking about board docs replacement, it was at the impetus of, I think I've spoken with several people on the board, or on the council, and the mayor as well as Catherine, and um, even Lori and I have had some conversations. Um, <clears throat> there's several reasons, you can go down, um, that, we want to, that we need to look at it. Uh, the first and foremost, and these, again, these are all things that people have talked about in the past. And board docs is certainly a little long in the tooth. It's probably, Lori can probably tell me better, but I bet it's at least eight or nine years old. Um, but responsive design is one of the first things we talk about uh, where it's not really built to do it, to work anywhere effectively except on desktops or laptops. So it's not built to work on tablets or phones, things like that. There's the uh, improved accessibility and equity. Those two things go hand in hand. And if you were to look at putting board docs and the sites that board docs creates through any of the free uh, accessible uh, accessibility meters, they score well below 50%. 75% is where you uh, have to be above 75%. You typically won't get sued for accessibility issues. So there's some major accessibility issues. And as we all know, if you can't get to something from, if you're blind or visually impaired, you have motor or dexterity or cognitive issues, those accessibility issues pervade throughout the current system. Um, in terms of increasing the efficiency for someone like Lori and, and President Paul, when you all work on building the, the, the uh, agendas, uh, modern search architecture is one of the pieces that we've heard a lot. Um, I know there's some people that have figured out ways to make the, modern, the, the search in open docs work, but there's much more modern uh, applications to search docs or search engines. And then community visibility, um, one of the things we've heard a lot is how do we, how can we do a better job of managing the boards and commissions and the vacancies and terms and seats and things like that. And something like board docs has a difficulty doing that, but there are other systems out there that, that do allow for some of those uh, improvements. So we can 
Um, so the next one. So we started a process based on all of this. We put an RFP together. We put it out uh, in late June, early July, um, and we asked interested parties to submit. Uh, and we gave about we we gave a two week deadline for asking questions. We asked questions, posted those on our RFP site, and then another two weeks to respond to the proposal. Um, having been on that side of the table in the past, generally speaking, four weeks is more than enough time to pull a proposal together. We unfortunately only got two. We got one from a web developer that was just going to create a custom website, and we got one from a company called Granicus, which is, they build uh, specific municipal uh, purposed sites that are not only um, websites, but also what we're looking at from a board docs replacement. We started reviewing them and it quickly became evident that the, the web developer, the custom web developer, wasn't gonna deliver what we were really looking for. And so we did ask for a, a brief demo. Uh, we invited um, Lori, we invited Catherine Schad, we invited several other people in, uh, in innovation and technology and across the city to come in and take a look um, just to see what specifically about board docs, um, the replacement for board docs, how that was gonna work. Um, and what we came up with is we do think that board docs is, or that Granicus is probably a viable solution, but I don't know that it's the only one out there, and I'm not 100% sure that we want to jump into the, that boat right now without seeing anything else. Um, so in reality, there's four options that we could look at. One is uh, we could continue with just using board docs there, we can explore to see if there are any uh, updated versions of board docs that, that would meet the requirements that we would have. We could reopen the RFP process, and in reality, that may be the best option we have for doing this, is to reopen the RFP process and see if we can get other uh, respondents, or even reopen the RFP process and actually pointedly look at certain companies if we wanted to find out if they were interested and at least alert them. What we heard, ironically, Two days after we closed the RFP, we got a, a marketing email, just literally a marketing email out of the blue for another company that we do use some of their modules here at the city. They asked us to come to a webinar to show us their board and agenda management system. And where were you two weeks ago? Where, how did you not see the RFP? Um, and then finally, we could decide as a, as a group, we could just decide to go to Granicus. I'm, I'm kind of leaving it a little bit here, but I think uh, my recommendation would be either um, going through uh, and asking for a, a, a reopening the RFP, asking for more respondents, or even pointedly asking certain uh, certain software providers where we already use some of the modules of those software providers, but we know they have others. We could ask to see what their offerings are. Um, in reality, it boils down to this. No matter what we get, whether it's Granicus or a custom website or something from someone else, if we don't do process reengineering, we won't see the benefits of it. So we will see some of the same issues, but we'll have new, more frustrating screens because no one will understand the new frustrating screens. So part of this is all about making sure we not only pick the right solution, but also pick the right, um, make the right efforts to do process reengineering so that we can really take advantage of the new system. And I would argue that standing still and not doing anything, just using board docs as it is, is probably the least desirable from anybody's position. I can't imagine that's the way anybody wants to go at this point, but it is certainly a viable option if we want to go that route. So that was kind of me walking through everything, open for questions. It's kind of a lot to take in. Great. Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul, uh, and thanks for that update. Yep. Um, it's a little disappointing, though. You know, only get two res respondents. Yeah, yeah, yeah only two totally disappointing. Um, <laughs> I want a comment first off. I, I saw uh, Superintendent Flanagan here. The district uses board docs as well, so we should probably collaborate with them a little bit and see if, if they've done any. I'm happy to. Um, <laughs> but then also a couple of questions. The cost of Granicus is it expensive and is it configurable? That, what little you know about it anyways? It's it's very configurable. It would definitely handle what, what we need from a city council perspective. My gut would tell me it would probably handle what you're looking for as well if we wanted to collaborate that direction. It definitely manages com boards and commissions very well. It also has a community engagement piece and it has a focus built uh, municipal website capability which is important because we have some of the same issues on our website as we do with board docs in terms of uh, responsive design and, and accessibility. 
So we could do all of those. It is not an inexpensive solution. I want to say we spend between ten and 15000 a year on board docks. And um, I want to say the first year for the implementation, buying everything, is somewhere close to 100 with Granicus and maybe 50, 50 to 60 a year going forward. But we would be replacing several systems with that, uh, including the, potentially the website. Uh, thanks. And could you talk a little bit about the process engineering need, re-engineering needed that you sure. mentioned? Sure. <clears throat> I think it's that's a little bit of an effort to dig into how is it how is it that we can leverage the new system. So, understanding exactly what we do to go what goes into building an agenda, managing the minutes, all those pieces, understanding what what is working very well and what the friction points are, and then de designing a process around fixing those, resolving those friction points. Uh, and using a system like um, Granicus, it, Board Docs, Civic Plus, any of them, will, it will allow us to kind of leverage some of that technology if we better understood where the friction points are in our process and how we want to get around them. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Are there other councillors who have questions? Uh, Councillor Shannon, who uh, certainly should be credited as when she was council president who brought us Board Docs. Nice. And before that... We Dark had, ages. We got had stacks yeah. and stacks of paper that were delivered to our homes. I in promise we don't want to go that direction. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think we can all agree there. I I just wondered if um, you know the board doc system has remained the same for us all of these years. Are there upgrades through that company that can meet our needs? That price differential is um, is pretty big and I'm a little bit unclear why board docs doesn't work for commissions. Um, I think part of the reason board docs might not work for commissions is maybe partly the process engineering. We may need to dig in and try to leverage the system differently or better for boards and commissions. Um, I do know that what one of the main differences between the pricing is that we've only chosen to use one piece of board docs and that price for Granicus was really for the entire suite of things they offer. If we were to start cutting things out and only using certain pieces, it would be a, a considerably different price at that point, I believe. Um, and I think, you know, in terms of how we could leverage either one of them going forward, I do think that there are new releases for board docs. Um, they did not respond to the RFP either. Um, I wish they had even res responded. It's one of the ones we could go after and say, hey, we'd like to figure out and talk to you about what you do have. Um, well, I don't think that we should, uh, particularly if you feel like there's something else out there, if there may be something more, both either something mm -hmm. better or something more competitive, and um, the least painful thing may be if Board Docs has something that meets our needs better. Um, we actually got the system, from the school started using the system before, <clears throat> before we did. Mm -hmm. Um, so we adopted what they were already using. Right. Um, and having, yeah, fewer, the, fewer, the fewer different systems, the better, I think. But I would certainly be open to, um, you know, soliciting bids from other companies that can provide the service for us. Yeah, I, I think that's a great response. I think if we can go and ask board docs and ask a couple of the other companies that we do use modules from today, I think it might give us a better view of what um, what's out there. Absolutely. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Uh, Councillor Hansen. Thanks. Yeah, I would agree that we should reopen the RFP and, and keep looking. And this is a, you know, this decision will probably last for years down the road. And we want to find a, a website that's easy to use, not just for folks in the city, but for the entire general public. So um, I think we should open it up and, you know, get, get more options on the table and more prices on the table. Um, so I would support that. But thanks so much for your work on this and for yep. giving That's us nice. the update. You bet. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Um, I don't see any other councillors with questions. Oh, Councillor Travers. Sorry, just briefly. Uh, agreed. Thank you for the presentation. Agree with Councillor Hansen's point that 
I, I think we should open the RFP process, as you suggested, and if there's any particular programs that you've identified, uh, I would also suggest our reaching out to them, perhaps more pointedly, to invite them to respond to the RFP. Uh, and just the only other piece on my end is, um, in reaching out to these companies, I don't know if you have already, but if they have uh, a, a, a testing platform or some opportunity for us to hop in there to see how it operates uh, versus board docs, or, or even if we're aware of other municipalities that rely on these programs, if counselors could have an opportunity uh, to work within it and, and understand how it works, I think that would be helpful before we're asked to fully uh, move forward with uh, any platform that, that uh, we want to go with. So thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, we can make that happen. We Great. definitely... For Granicus, we can pass along some municipalities that we know are using it, and as we open it up, we can look at more as well. That'd Absolutely. be great. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Travers. I agree with that. That would be incredibly helpful if we could take a look at that. Um, were there other councillors who had questions? And, are, and also, are there any councillors who don't? It, it appears as though the broad consensus is to continue the search. Is there anyone who feels otherwise? Um, if not, I think you, I hope, oh, Councillor Jang. Yeah, I think uh, the sentiment of having board doc to upgrade what we're looking for to make it more accessible, I think it should not be rooted out. Yeah, I think you understand. I, oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Totally agree. Okay. Thank you. Yes, we don't need to reinvent the wheel if we have a, a wheel that just needs a little help. Right, and with the an, an upgrade, if, if Board Docs offers any upgrades and a process re-engineering effort, we may get as much benefit out of that as anything else. So absolutely a great idea. Do you feel like that's uh, enough direction from us? I think so. Yep, okay. I think I'm good. I'll keep well, it Well, that's great. Um, I guess the you. one question I do have, just to yes. make sure, we are not in, in from from our perspective, we're not up against a date from a licensing or contract. Are there any, are we up against any dates from your perspective, deadlines, or is it just a matter of let's make sure we get the right one? Uh, no, I mean, I think the, I think when we had the council retreat in May, one of the things that did come up was the fact that we felt, you know, board docs, is, as Councilor Shannon said, I mean, when we started with board docs, I don't think it's any different now than it was when we started with board mm -hmm. docs. It was a huge leap forward for the council, but in terms of the actual system that we're using, it's ef effectively the same, and it's done in a piecemeal approach, as you've mentioned. And that was, I, I think that's probably one of the, the, the biggest challenges, is that people just don't know where to look for information. It may, it's very, con if it's confusing for us, then it certainly is confusing for people who really don't understand the system right. as we do. Correct. Okay, great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much yeah. for your work on this. We'll look forward to hearing. Uh, hopefully we'll get more responses, and uh, if, even if it takes a little more proactive work. We'll, we'll pull some responses out of people. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, with that, we'll close item uh 3.01, we've completed the public forum, which moves us on to pub, uh, item five, which is climate emergency reports. Is there any counselor or the administration who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Uh, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Um, there are actually uh, two um, notable updates I wanted to share with the council and the public. Um, one <clears throat> is that um, in on your consent agenda tonight, we talked about it at the Board of Finance, uh, we are um, uh, making a uh, airport purchase of a electric sweeper, um, which will help maintain the uh, facilities um, at at the airport, I, I highlight this just because I think this is a really promising, exciting direction that we're now starting to see this sort of large uh, piece of equipment that we use for um, maintaining the city is, is, is starting to switch over from being fossil fuel burning to uh, electric. And uh, this, uh, uh, Nick uh, <coughs> Longo, our acting aviation director, I, I said, I, to me, that the, the only thing else in the fleet we had like it was our electric Zamboni out at the uh, Letty Arena, and turns out that um, 
uh, it's a pretty similar piece of equipment. But uh, so just um, as the council knows, we are looking to electrify everything we can um, when uh, we are making fleet purchases. And, and here's uh, an example of uh, a kind of new innovation and, and progress there. The other um, uh, update, one that uh, is quite exciting and ultimately I think more impactful is that um, uh, the Burlington Electric Department uh, is um, moving forward with plans and seeking a public service board approval f for a, uh, basically t taking advantage of a new tariff that will um, allow uh, low and moderate income users, uh, uh, customers to s uh, receive uh, different electric rates um, and uh, and to use on-bill financing for certain electric uh, uh, upgrades. And this is, uh, you know, one, I think, appropriate criticism of the move towards um, net zero and electrification is that the benefits um, and the, uh, of of this direction are uh, up until this point, uh, they you know it, it's been a real challenge finding ways for those benefits to flow to uh, customers who are low and moderate income customers. The BD has worked very hard on this and made some real progress. Um, this is a substantial new policy change that um, should open uh, some real additional possibilities. As soon as this receives public service board approval, um, we will. Uh, be, you know, very, be, there'll be a lot of communications about how people take advantage of this, and that's still a little ways off, but uh, we're, we're, we're making progress towards it. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Are there counselors who have a climate emergency report? Seeing none, we'll close that item and continue with item six, which is our consent agenda, uh, our consent agenda. Uh, is there a motion to move our consent agenda and take the actions indicated? So moved. Uh, thank you, Councillor McGee, seconded by uh, Councillor Jang. Is there any discussion on the motion uh, to move our consent agenda? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor, uh, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, we have approved our consent agenda which moves us on to item seven, which is the deliberative agenda. We have a number of items on our deliberative agenda in the interest of time and being able to accomplish everything on our agenda and adjourn within our rules. There are minutes allotted to the agenda items, uh, which we approved when we approved our agenda. Uh, as per our council rules, I will do my best to see that we adhere to our approved agenda. Um, and with that, the first item is 7.01, which is a public hearing on two proposed ordinance changes. The first is regarding ZA 22-07, which is maximum parking and transportation demand management. Um, and then the second is uh, ZA 22-08 on short-term rentals. Um, the way that public hearings work is that you may sign up to speak either in person or online. We will open the public forum and uh, those who wish to speak, um, even, if you haven't, even if you haven't filled out a form, you're certainly welcome to just simply raise your hand um, and we will um, have you speak. Um, or if you're online, you can use the raise hand function as well. Um, we will then close the public hearing after all those who have wanted to speak have spoken. Um, and move on to further business with these two items. So with that, we'll open the public hearing, and if there are people who wish to speak to either item, uh, please raise your hand or, um, in, as well, online, use the raise hand function. And Aaron, if you could just let us know if there is anyone who has used the raise hand function, uh, that'd be great.
Is that to is that to indicate that there is no one who has used the raise hand function online? Question. Can I ask a question? Oh, we can do it. Uh, Councillor Shannon. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I just want a clarification about this process. Um, if there are amendments to this ordinance, I know there are some cases where. Um, we can't make a change unless it's based on public comment. And so I wondered if there was a de desire to make an amendment, does it require warning another public hearing in the future on this or so just, <laughs> I think you understand where I'm going. I I think I understand where you are going. Um, my understanding is that yes, in fact, there there is, um, but I can defer that to um, our parliamentarian who may have an opinion on that as well. Yeah, I'm not sure if I'm prepared to address that in the abstract. Is, is there, what specifically are you contemplating here? I, I'm Go not ahead, contemplating Jane, anything right. in particular, actually. I just I just thought that there might be some um, potential amendments to this and um, wanted to clarify what the what the process would be for amending this. Looks like Director Tuttle may have some I don't know. If it's okay, I could weigh in. Um, this question was asked of Attorney Sturdivant earlier today, and she shared a section of state statute that, oh, she's here. I'll let her address this question, sorry. Uh, city Attorney, Acting City Attorney Sturdivant, please. Uh, good evening. Um, so with zoning ordinances, it depends actually what the changes are, what uh, level of process is required. Um, the statute, um, which is 24 VSA 4442B, um, talks about that the legislative mod body may make minor changes to the proposed bylaw amendment or repeal. They should not do so less than 14 days prior to the final public hearing. If they make uh, the legislative body at any time make substantial changes in concept, meaning, or extent of the proposed bylaw, um, it shall warrant a new public hearing. And um, if there's changes, the legislative body at least 10 days prior to the hearing shall file a copy of the changes with the clerk. And there's a little bit more to that, but we can I can certainly share that depending on the outcome of this process. Okay, thank you. Thanks so much. Um, with regard to the public hearing, um, there are it does not appear as though there's anyone who has raised their hand to speak remotely, nor are there persons in contois. Um, with that, we will um, close the public hearing and move on to item 7.02, which is the uh, CDO parking minimum and maximum parking requirements and transportation demand, which is ZA-22-07. This is for a fourth reading. Um, and with that, I'll go to the chair of the ordinance committee, which is Councillor Travers. Uh, for a motion. Uh, thank you, President Paul. I'd move to postpone this item until our meeting on October 17th, 2022, and would ask for the floor back upon a second. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, there is a second to that motion from Councillor Hightower. You have the floor back. Thank you, President Paul. Um, this item with respect to minimum maximum parking requirements as well as transportation demand management uh, has been making its way through uh, the Ordinance Committee and Planning Commission uh, well before I joined this council and has had quite a bit of public input. Uh, we've received as of late though um, uh, uh, some further feedback, particularly from the uh, affordable housing community with respect to uh, this proposed ordinance's uh, impact uh, on their operations and the intent behind this uh, further postponement um, is to uh, meet with partners in the affordable housing community uh, to, to fully hear and understand their concerns and, and take them into consideration before ultimately moving on this. Uh, so that is the purpose of the motion and is why I will be supporting it. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, this uh, motion to postpone is debatable, so if there are other councillors who wish to offer any comments, um, now would be the time. Uh, Councillor Hansen. Great, thanks. Um, and thanks to Councillor Travers for doing really a lot of legwork on this policy, not only the policy itself, but engaging with different stakeholders. Um, I will vote yes on postponement, although I don't, it's not what I think we should be doing, but um, you know, I want this policy to pass. I think it's critical. And um, I think postponing probably gives us a better chance of getting the strongest possible version of this policy adopted. Um, but I, I just wanted to voice my concern, which I've voiced many times, which is that on the issue of transportation, I feel that as a city, we continue to really drag our feet and, and we're moving very slowly on changing a system that we need to change really rapidly um, in order to address the climate crisis, as well as the other co-benefits of, of shifting our transportation system, making it safer, more accessible, more affordable. Um, so yeah, I'll, I'll support the postponement, but I, I think we need to, from a process perspective and from a policy perspective, I think we really need to change how we're addressing this issue of transportation. And we need to be moving more quickly on policy and we need to have processes that enable us to move more quickly if we're really gonna make the, the shift that I think many of us agree is necessary. Um, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. Um, again, this is on the motion to postpone. Are there any other councillors who wish to offer comments? Seeing none, uh, we um, have a... Sorry, my hand's up. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor House. We can't see you, so I sorry. didn't realize. My, my apologies. I'm not really sure why you're not showing on the screen. But by all means, please go ahead. No worries at all. Thank you, President Paul. Um, yeah, I just, I wanted to say I'm um, in favor of the postponement. And um, I certainly agree that we do need to um, make decisions about this rapidly. You know, the, um, the climate crisis is not going to wait. However, um, I also don't think that we should build the um, climate justice movement on the backs of, um, you know, the um, most, the folks who are most marginalized in our city. Um, and, and that includes the affordable housing community. So I'm glad that we're doing our due diligence on this. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor House. Uh, are there other councillors who wish to offer any comments on the motion to postpone? Uh, seeing none, we have a motion to postpone with a second. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously, and that item will be um, will come back to us um, in October, on October 17th. Is that correct? Yes. Correct. Yes. So it, it won't be at our next meeting, but the meeting after that, the first meeting in October. Um, thank you, Councillor Travers, and to all for your work on this, as well as Director Tuttle. Uh, that will move us on to item 7.04, or 7.03, which is an ordinance, the Comprehensive Development Ordinance on Short-Term Rentals, which is ZA-22-08, and this is for a third reading. I will go to Councillor Travers for a motion. Thank you, President Paul. I'd move to waive the third reading and adopt the ordinance as amended by the Planning Commission, and upon a second, would ask for Director Tuttle to provide us a report. Uh, thank you. A uh, motion has been made and seconded by uh, Councillor Hightower. Um, thank you. We will go to uh, Director Tuttle, and certainly if you could let us know if there have been any changes, and if so, what they were when it went to the Planning Commission, that would be helpful. Thank you, and thanks for being here. Of course. This amendment is a complement to the changes you adopted earlier this year to implement the short-term rental framework in Burlington. 
Uh, this is to adopt the zoning pieces of that framework, uh, which is pretty straightforward compared to the policy that you enacted earlier this year through the minimum housing code. Uh, this simply uh, provides a definition for a short-term rental in the city's zoning ordinance, um, provides some clarifications to definitions for other lodging types, and indicates that short-term rentals are permitted in the city wherever residential uses are provided. It then makes reference to the specific standards and limitations for where short-term rentals can operate and how that are contained in Chapter 18, which you've already adopted. The only change that was made as this went through the Planning Commission process was a simple technical correction to the document that uh, is called Article 14 Plan BTV Downtown Code. This is a section of the use table that applies to the two form districts in the downtown core. Um, previously, there was a reference to a section of our ordinance that where we were going to put all of the short-term rental um, details in our ordinance, but since we moved it to Article 18, it was no longer relevant. So we just cleaned that up. Otherwise, this is exactly as it was referred to you earlier this year. Great. Thank you very much for that, uh, that update. Uh, are there any questions or comments from the council? Ca Councilor Bergman? Um, as I indicated, uh, Previously, um, I'm not a big fan of uh, short-term rentals. I ended up supporting that uh, uh, chapter 18, and I voted to uh, refer this, and I am inclined, absent uh, hearing something shocking, to support this as well. But I do th want the administration to provide a report to this council about the numbers of people who have registered uh, their units and the locations of those units. Um, I'd like to understand the same with regard to what is now called lodgings so that we can get a sense of that and get the other information like uh, the, um, the tax revenues that have been raised. So we made some uh, serious changes. People said it's going to be the best thing since sliced bread and I want to see the loaf. I can uh, relay that. Thank you, comment. thank you, Councilor Bergman. Yes, please. Sorry, President Paul. No worries. I can relay that request as well to DPI. Um, as of the adoption of the Article 18 ordinance and the warning of this amendment for public hearing, um, the changes that you all adopted have been in effect since August 3rd. And I know that DPI has been working incredibly hard to get set up with Granicus, who is helping us with enforcement and um, kind of moving through the process of getting everybody set up with the licenses that they are required to have. So I can share that with them and we can talk about what would be the right point in time for bringing that report back. Um, just to be clear, I would like that sooner than later. And I, I see this as being something that we want to visit uh, periodically during the course of the year, not just a, a one snap in time. Uh, the housing crisis is outrageous and um, the amount of money that people are paying is sickening, and um, I want to make sure that what I have supported is not making that worse. I'm not sure that I made the right choice, so I would like the data, data to uh, help me. Thank you. Th thank you, Councillor Han uh, Sorry, Councillor Bergman. Uh, we'll go to Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Um, while I, I agree really with everything that Council Bergman said, this is really just aligning the zoning ordinance with the what was adopted in Chapter 18, and it's a bit of a quandary when I don't agree with what was adopted in Chapter 18. What do I do with the um, <clears throat> changes to the zoning ordinance that help that make sense? I think that... Um, it's actually taking this out of zoning that I find most objectionable at a baseline. I disagree with the council's action to make it easier to, um, to get a short-term rental. Uh, true, because we were not enforcing our regulations, people were 
creating short-term rentals illegally, um, and it became kind of a rampant pattern in the city, but it was not legal. And what we've done is made it easier by law to establish short-term rentals. And by taking it out of the zoning ordinance, we've removed the public process that we have always had on, you know, when you created any kind of bed and breakfast, it was always required that you went through a zoning, zoning process, and now it's only requiring a registration process, which I object to. So um, while it is a quandary, I am going to vote no, because I think it's important to voice my disagreement with this policy, and, and that's the way I'm going to choose to do that tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Uh, are there other councillors who wish to offer comments on this ordinance before we go to a vote? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Councillor Travers. Uh, thank you, President Paul. I, I, I believe this council, for the most part, has had a number of opportunities to uh, debate the issue uh, of, of short-term rentals, and I'm very pleased with where we landed. Uh, in June, I agree with Councillor Bergman um, that I would similarly like to uh, see a report, uh, because until we have that report, uh, the feedback we'll receive is, is merely anecdotal. Um, but what I can say is that anecdotally, what I've been hearing is that uh, folks, particularly in those buildings that we were most concerned about, which are uh, non-owner occupied uh, residential dwellings uh, that are being uh, converted into short-term rentals. Anecdotally, I've been hearing that, that folks have gotten the message uh, that no longer uh, is that going to be uh, permitted here in Burlington. Um, so I, I, I do not agree that with the actions we took uh, earlier in the summer uh, that we've made it easier in Burlington to operate a short-term rental. I think our ordinances and zoning regulations as they were uh, Ha, were not uh, adapted yet or adopted yet to um, uh, comply with this relatively new uh, lodging in, in short-term rentals that we see on Airbnbs and, and VRBO. Um, and I think we've taken steps to, uh, we kept saying before that we were trying to fit a square peg into a round hole with respect to short-term rentals. And I think we've brought a lot of clarity uh, to the matter, uh, but do agree with Councillor Bergman. I, I will look forward to seeing where we're at. Uh, sooner than later once we have that information in hand. Thanks. And I will be voting in support of this because I, I do understand and believe that is simply bringing uh, our zoning ordinances into compliance with the actions we took earlier in the summer. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, are there other councillors? Um, we have uh, a motion to waive the third reading and adopt the ordinance as amended by the Planning Commission. Uh, seeing no other comments from the council, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. 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 Okay, there, that would be Councillor House, Councillor Hansen, and Councillor Shannon, who um, have uh, indicated a no vote. Um, and I don't believe that Councillor Freeman is online, so that would mean 11. So that is. Uh, I'm here, Councillor Paul. Oh, Sorry. I'm so. I I'm so, I, I'm so I, no, I think my device just didn't unmute. I apologize. I was a yes. You're a yes. Okay. Yeah, All right. Sorry Thank, about that. Thanks for clarifying, and I'm glad mm -hmm. to have you here. Um, mm -hmm. That would mean that we are an 8 9 to 9 to 3 vote. So the motion passes. Um, we will move on to item 7.04, um, which is a presentation in response to a resolution that we passed at our last meeting regarding the creation of an additional seven ward redistricting map. And for this presentation, we have Director Tuttle with us, who is joined by Nancy Stetson, the senior, our senior policy and data analyst. Um, my understanding is that you will be presenting this alternative map and a plan uh, that you've developed with next steps uh, in this process to get us to a charter change um, coming in March, um, which seems like a long time from now, but really isn't that far when you start going through the dates, the, the benchmark dates. Um, so thank you both for being here and um, we're, we'll look forward to your presentation. All right, great. Are you all
all set to share. Uh, Nancy is actually going to walk us through a brief presentation to share with you the map, the seven by 12 counselors map that was posted on board docs, as well as some information about next steps. Great, thank you. It says host disabled. Um, so I want to start uh, with just reminding everybody and the public that you can find more information <laughs> um, about redistricting on the city website, including interactive maps where you can zoom into your part of the city and see how you might be affected. Um, but we're here today to um, bring you this map that you requested in August. Um, the request was that it was a seven ward map with five wards with two members, two wards with one member, and in, in the, with the goal of keeping the new north end and the old north end distinct. So I'm gonna show the map and then I have a couple more slides, but this should be brief. So this, um, ooh, the, the colors do not show up so well there, but this map is, is what I drew. Um, I see this as, as a draft map to sort of get us closer to what we're looking for. Um, the overall plan deviation is 9.7%, which is very close to the threshold, but just barely under it. The main changes that this map makes to, compared to previous maps is um, with these two smaller wards. So Ward 7 becomes a third of the New North End, and then Ward 3 becomes a sort of downtown ward that, again, elects only one counselor. Um, the, other, uh, the other thing these, this map does um, is it tries to preserve the polling places for the wards. Um, this particularly pertains to the south end where Edmonds remains part of Ward 6 and the block that has Bobbin Mill and the Barge Canal and BED is split in two so that BED can stay um, <coughs> uh, the polling place for Ward 5, but Bob and Mill can join the King Maple neighborhood in Ward 3. This is the map. I, I guess I should run through the slides before questions. The other thing I looked at for, for this meeting was on the student population. There's concerns about how the students will be divided across the wards. Uh, so we only have data on where on-campus students live, but citywide there are about 6,000 students. They are really, you can see here, they are concentrated um, on the UVM athletic and Redstone campuses south of Main Street on the top of the hill. That's where nearly 4,000 students live, so that is the area that we have to um, grapple with. Um, I also looked at how these students make up parts of wards depending on which plan we choose. So you can see in the current uh, ward configuration, two thirds of Ward 8 residents are on campus students. These students um, are moved to Ward 6 in some of these other plans. And so in the map I just presented, 60% of Ward 6 residents would be these on campus students. The one thing I, I do just want to note that this does not account for off-campus students and off-campus students are concentrated in certain neighborhoods and so this doesn't show the full picture of, of where student populations are. Finally, we have a draft schedule. There, I guess the, the final schedule for when um, these maps need to be approved hasn't, is, isn't set yet, but we expect it's gonna be by December at some point. Um, so working back from that, our hope is that we can come up with a final map or a couple final maps for the October 17th meeting um, and work towards that goal with the rest of the September in, in time to send it to Charter Change and have it approved in December. 
And I think with that, um, we're happy to any entertain any questions or comments that you have about this additional map that was requested. Um, and you know, we're happy to work with a couple of counselors moving forward from tonight to help refine either this map or any other maps to help us meet the objective of having something for referral in October. Thank you. Thank you both for, uh, for this presentation. Um, we'll, go to, uh, we'll go to the council now. Um, Councilor, Councilor Barlow, please. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I thank you for that presentation and for that additional map that you've made for us all. Um, I'd like to move uh, that the council approve a work session during September with Nancy Stetson and a small group including Councilors Hightower, McGee, Travers, uh, and myself to discuss and revise the maps that have been presented to the Council so far. Uh, so thank you. Uh, that's a, a motion. Um, is there a second to that motion? Uh, seconded by Councilor Hightower. Um, is there any discussion on that motion to refer this to a, a smaller working group who will work with uh, Nancy Stetson um, on bringing us something back on October 17th. Councillor Hightower, and then we'll go to Councillor Jang. Not gonna lie, I wasn't expecting that motion, but I'm glad to have my uh, name in it. Or probably text, I mean, I just didn't see it. Um, I do, I am curious um, as to what folks think more generally um, about this map. I do wanna just point to Robert Bristow Johnson's comments and the comments about if we did work on this map, that that does, means potentially having elections every year for some wards and every other year for other wards. I wonder how folks feel about having elections every other year for all of the wards, um, which I think is an interesting option, especially with us considering or implementing ranked choice voting for counselors. Um, so just throwing that out there as a part of a larger discussion, um, but I'm also fine with moving this to a working group. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Councillor uh, Hightower. If there are councillors who wish to offer an opinion, they can certainly do so. We, in the meantime, we will go to Councillor Jang. Thanks. Uh, thank you, President Paul. And I don't know which one I need to respond to, the motion or um, <laughs> what I think about the map. Well, we have a, we, a motion came to us right off the bat. Okay. So we are talking about the motion. After that, we certainly, you certainly could if you wish. Um, we'll try to stay within the, the item that's in front of us. Absolutely, thank you. And whatever I say here, if I um, basically, uh, my intention is basically to just reiterate that being an independent elected official is not easy. But I want to recognize the work that you have done here. It's a beautiful. Thank you so much. And this has not been, this did not start today. You've been around. I'm pretty sure maybe a baby can be born. This process is not even done yet, you know. So what I just wanted to understand the names of the people that were picked to be in this small, how the decision of bringing those people forward came through, are they all in the same committee working together? Or is it a specific committee that will be working on it? And if not, how did you decide on picking a couple of people to work on this? Uh, Councillor, we'll just go for an answer to Councillor Barlow, and then if you want the floor back, Councillor Jang, of course. Uh, sure, and thanks for that question. Um, I don't know, it was probably back in June, like probably early July maybe. Um, some of us had been talking about redistricting and um, the four of us had met because we represented geographically um, sort of the different areas of the city and then politically we also had a diversity there as well. And um, some of the um, some of the objectives that were more important to certain groups um, or in some of the concerns groups had were sort of well encapsulated within the four of us. So we thought that streamlined group then could work to try to uh, arrive at some consensus um, or at least try to forge a consensus 
position that the council could support. And so we've been continuing. We, we've met a couple of times since the initial redistricting discussions, but this map came out of one of those discussions. So my thinking was since this group had been sort of steeped in a lot of the minutia of redistricting, um, that it would be a logical group to con continue to try to do this last refinement on the maps that have been presented to the council so far. Councilor Jang. Thank yep. you, Councilor Barlow. Thank you. Um, I definitely will not be mo voting forward for the motion in front of us. Yeah, because I do believe that it is not at the discretion of some city councils to make this decision, but at least the president of the council, based on people's interests, can appoint people if they are interested to be in that committee, but not at the discretion of some city councils. I'll be voting no. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jang. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. <laughs> thank you, President Paul. Um, I think sometimes we do appoint, the, the council itself appoints a committee and one has been offered. I don't object to um, Councillor Jang's idea that the council president could appoint the committee, but I also appreciate that some councilors have taken the initiative to try and find consensus. I actually really welcome that, and I'd like to thank those councilors for, for doing that. So um, it does make sense uh, to me to proceed with those same councilors unless the councilor, council president had some objection to that. Um, so I will support that. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Uh, any other comments from any other councillors uh, before we would go to a vote on the motion? Um, yes. Uh, Councillor House, you have your hand up, yes? Yes, sorry, um, my mic was not unmuting. That's Thank okay. you, President Paul. Um, yeah, I think um, just when it comes to this issue in general, I just want to say, um, I am still in favor of the eight ward two rep map. I think I've made that very clear, but um, I've heard from a lot of my constituents, um, especially those who, um, you know, will end up in um, ward three that they, uh, they have some real concerns about um, only having one representative, whereas um, folks in other districts will have two. Um, and I also see that as a concern. I think that even if we put um, elections on um, every other year across the board, um, you know, they, they have a great point, which is that they would only have one um, representative to contact as opposed to two. Um, so I think it's really important um, just to keep that in mind for um, the folks in the ward uh, that would only have one representative. Thank you, Councillor House. Uh, any other comments from the council? Councillor Carpenter. Um, first off, I want to thank the councils that have worked on this, and I totally support this resolution. We've, we, we have a month left. We've got to narrow our decision points, and we can't have 12 of us doing it. Um, to be blunt, I shudder to think if there were 16 of us trying to do this, which is my concern about the 816 map. Um, so I'm just, that's an editorial comment, and just an editorial comment on the 712. It, it has a wee bit of awkwardness, but I live in a legislative district with one state legislator who serves me well, and she's quite capable of serving me well. She's smart and bright enough that she can serve me alone. I don't have to have two, and in fact, she serves people in the old North End and in the new North End and does it very well. So I don't think we have to say it can't work because it at least works in that case. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, any other comments from the council before we go to a vote? Um, we have a motion that has been seconded. Um, all those in favor? 
I have I have my hand up. Oh, I'm I'm sorry, Councillor Hansen. You're oh, okay. your size you're in size tiny and I can't I can't necessarily see. Now you're in size bigger. So please go ahead. All right. So should we wait to give it seems like folks are offering some comments more generally about the map and redistricting. Should I do that now or wait until after this vote? Well we we sort of have started that, so if you have any comments by all means. Go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah, I would just say, you know, my preference has always been smaller wards and whether it's 12, 14, 10, whatever, but individual single member, single ward, um, or secondary to that is the eight and two potential. But I think from a compromise perspective, I think this is, this map that we're seeing here today is the best path forward that I've seen to find a compromise that satisfies a lot of the different um, concerns and desires that I've heard from, from counselors. So, um, you know, with the interest of <clears throat> not being stuck in, in our current system, which I think is much worse than what's being proposed, um, as we've talked about, we are running a little bit short on time. So in my mind, this is our best way forward to date unless other folks change their opinion on things or we come up with more creative solutions. So I'm supportive of that and I'm supportive of um, this motion to have some counselors, you know, dig in deeper before we look at it again in October. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Councillor Hansen. I don't see a uh, Councillor Shannon and then Councillor Travers, and then we'll try to get to a vote. Is it um, is it okay to comment on the the map itself? It is okay to comment okay. on the map itself. Um, so, so if this does go to committee, I just wanted to to point out one thing that that I noticed in this, which is it it does create a downtown district that a lot of people had wanted. Um, but the way the lines are drawn, the, for example, Main Street, one side of Main Street would be in Ward 3, and the other side of Main Street would be in Ward, um, Ward 5. And I would think that people on Main Street in particular would want to be part of that downtown ward. And it looks a little bit gerrymandered. I, I don't think it was gerrymandered in the sense that it, you know, there was some intention to, to do something in particular or include some group. I can kind of understand why the piece of Ward 5, current Ward 5, was taken. Um, but I think it might be preferable to see if Main Street could be included in that downtown, both sides of Main Street included in that downtown ward, and it may come down to the challenges of census blocks. You know, I understand that we... It's not always easy to do exactly what we wanted to do, but just wanted to throw that out there for the committee to look at. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Councillor Travers. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, first of all, thank you to uh, Councillor Barlow for uh, including me as a part of this uh, committee. And uh, I look forward, if, if that were to happen, to continuing to work with you and uh, Councillor Hightower and Councillor McGee and building a consensus not only amongst ourselves, not only for this council, but uh, on a map that, that we feel uh, voters will ultimately support in March. Um, since we are talking about the maps, uh, among those we've seen, and this is no fault of Director Tuttle or, or Nancy Stetson, uh, you know, none, of the, none of the maps are perfect, right? If we had a perfect map, uh, we wouldn't still be here at this point in time. Um, all the maps that we've seen have pros, uh, but they also have cons, and so I will look forward to our, our fully hashing those out. I will just say uh, one item here, and this is an item that applies to pretty much every map we've seen, which is that one of the top concerns that we've heard all throughout this, including dating back to before and through the ad hoc redistricting process, is that folks are, are very concerned with the existing makeup of, of Ward 8 uh, and um, the uh, sort of vast majority student population within that ward. Uh, and an interest, there, there seemed to have been a general consensus uh, behind an interest in more evenly distributing the student population across wards. 
Uh, and one of the concerns that I saw in the presentation that we just saw here is whether it be a seven ward map or whether it be an eight ward map, um, that we seem to be, for the most part, simply moving an existing problem into potentially another ward. We see, I think, I don't have the, it up in front of me right now, but uh, I think the existing student population in Ward 8 is 66%. With the seven Ward 12 counselor map um, in Ward 6, the student population would be 60%. With one of the eight ward options we've seen, it's, it's 67%. And I get why that's happening, right? I suspect that one of the biggest hurdles that you found here is that we've been measuring these maps based on census blocks. Um, and, and for the most part, uh, we don't have census blocks uh, of populations over a thousand individuals. The one exception to that is the census blocks that contain uh, uh, the university dormitories. And when you add that block to one ward or another, suddenly the population of that ward increases by a thousand, two thousand plus individuals. And we end up with uh, the, this situation where we're out of sorts with uh, what we're required to do with respect to even populations. So. Um, I don't expect an answer necessarily now, but in, in proceeding from here, one of the things I would be very interested in further exploring is the extent to which in the interest, which again, there appears to be common consensus behind this in, in more evenly distributing the student population, whether or not in that interest, we can break the census blocks that contain student dormitories. And to that end, I think it will be important for us to not only know what the population of students is on a particular campus. We've had the athletic campus and the Redstone campus, but we're really gonna to need to know what the populations are in individual dormitories to decide uh, the extent to which we can fairly and, and more evenly distribute those census blocks. So if we are to move with this uh, committee, um, that is something that I would be interested in taking a look at is, is first of all, what is the city's position on whether or not we can break uh, the census blocks, given how those census blocks are completely different than the other census blocks you see throughout the rest of the city. Uh, and then second, if, if the city is, is open to that, um, whether or not we can get information, further information from the universities as to the uh, population or, or general population of the individual dormitories. Thanks. I, I can't answer that. We, we do have data by dorm for the UVM um, dorms. So, and from what I understand, it would be possible to split those blocks. The only thing I would, I would just say is that that block, while it's also, while it's a large block, it's also the densest block in the city and that there are just a lot of students that live up there and that they will have to go in, even if we split them in half, that would end up making two wards have a lot of students in them. So they, they will just have to be put somewhere. Okay, thank you, thank you, and thank you, Councillor Travers. Um, uh, bef uh, I don't know if Councillor Hansen and Councillor House have their hand up again, or if that was from a prior it request was to speak. We, we put them back up. Okay, all right. Um, uh, Councillor Hansen to be followed by Councillor House. Great, thanks. I just, I wanted to respond to Councillor Travers, Travers because I think we, I mean, yeah, first of all, there's no getting around that we're a college town and there's gonna be super student heavy districts or wards. Um, but I think a lot of the concern with Ward 8 is that it specifically gerrymanders on campus with off campus student housing. And the percentages I, on the screen, I think we're just showing on campus students, right? That's I can't really see the room. Yeah, so I think what Councillor Traverse said about this shift, I actually don't think is true that, I, I think it is actually a substantial shift because it's less on-campus students in the new Ward 6 than the current Ward 8, but it's also way less off-campus students because it's not, it's not combining a neighborhood that's almost all students in with dorms it's combining a neighborhood that's mostly non-students in with dorms so i think the overall mix um, is is much more balanced in this new map than what we currently have um, thanks thank you councillor hansen we'll go to councillor house and then uh, if we could maybe get to a, a vote councillor house please 
Yeah, um, I do. I do agree with Councillor Hansen's point. I think sometimes it feels like um, we as um, a council kind of play hot potato um, with the student um, population, but specifically the dorms, just because of how difficult it is um, to campaign there, giving the university university's policies on that kind of stuff. But I, I think it it also opens up this greater um, dialogue of the fact that UVM restricts students access to information about their local government that every other person who lives in our city is afforded. Um, I don't believe there are very many other places in our city where we can't um, go door to door and campaign. And I think it, you know, I, I, I think that students are smart. I think they um, would love to hear um, sort of all opinions um, from around our city. And I, I think that um, it also um, kind of begs the question of what can we do um, as a council, you know, to potentially work with the university to kind of um, change that. Because I think that an engaged um, student population is going to be a population um, that cares about taking care of our city versus right now maybe they don't have access to um, the knowledge or the information that they need um, to really understand how our city functions um, and take care of it. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor House. Um, there was one item that I did want to ask uh, because we do have Acting City Attorney uh, Kim Sturdivant, who's still on Zoom with us. Um, the motion that was made is to approve a work session, and this is not with a committee. This is a small group of counselors as opposed to a committee. Um, and I'm hoping, um, Attorney Sturdivant, that you could respond to, um, it was your opinion that uh, because this is not the formation of a formal committee, that we did not need to go through any more of a process than just simply a motion. Um, and if you could also speak to whether or not uh, that this smaller working group would need to be publicly warned and how that would, how you would encourage us to move forward with that work session with Nancy and the four city councilors, should this be approved? Um, certainly. So I looked at it a little bit earlier um, this afternoon, so didn't have a full review of it, but uh, basically based on that review of um, looking at an informal work sessions um, and not setting up a committee, um, but I also have heard that term being used a number of times by counselors, so I think that you should be clear of what you're trying to set up. Um, and then, yes, I think, you know, in, in, and then suggesting the the working committee is um was the way that the the motion was stated so i believe that's fine so so the the question that i have is it that i i i hear what you're saying and i did get that emailed from you earlier um because there are four counselors it's not a majority of the council but there are four who will be working on this is this um is the protocol that they should use going forward with this work session to be warning this as a public meeting and to have a public forum at that meeting. So I will certainly look at it closer before they start having their next meeting, but initially as an informal working group, um, I, I don't believe so, but I will follow up with the staff to make sure that that occurs correctly. Okay, um, I think that is a concern and it, it certainly is something that others have voiced to me during the day to, uh, today. So would want to make sure that we do we do this correctly and give the public, as well as other counselors, if they wish to be there, the opportunity. So I'm I'm a little bit concerned about that. Um, uh, do want to go to a vote, but I know that Councillor Bergman wants to um, wants to speak. Please go ahead, and then uh, hopefully we can go to a vote. Sure. Uh, two things I would like some clarification again on the members of this uh, so-called. Um, small working group and uh, the second thing is I don't think there is any doubt that this is a body of the uh, of the council no matter what you call it no matter what artful language you use and therefore it is subject to the open meeting law and I think it was it is just suicidal 
to hold a redistricting uh, meeting not in public. I, I, insanity is another word that comes to my mind. So uh, I, I think that even if you got a, um, an opinion from an attorney that said that you didn't have to do it, uh, I w if I were on that committee, I wouldn't touch that with a 10-foot pole, and I would tell you right now, I would think that it's a terrible, terrible idea, and I would say so again and again and again. So you take that for what it's worth. But the, um, the, the recitation of the um, members of the, this so-called group, non-group. Are you looking for the names? I am. Okay. Well, uh, as, as put in the motion, it was Councilors Barlow, uh, Travers, Hightower, and McGee. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, I, I think, I, I, for what it's worth, I, I do tend to agree with Councilor Bergman and would hope that the members of the committee would uh, take that to, uh, take that to, he take that as, uh, that word, those words of wisdom and uh, incorporate that in their working in the meeting that they have should this motion pass. Um, we have a motion on the floor in a second um, to refer this to a smaller group to work with uh, Nancy Stetson and um, that would be Councilors McGee, uh, Hightower, Traverse, and Barlow. Um, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 And all those opposed, please say no. No. Uh, so, uh, Councilor Jang says no, um, and that motion passes 11 to 1. Um, thank you so much, um, Director Tuttle, and to uh, Policy Analyst Stetson for being here, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, you coming back to us uh, in the month of October. Um, we will then move on to item 7.05, which is a school presentation, the Burlington High School uh, and Burlington Technical Center project to include an update on funding efforts and other progress being made since our last meeting in August, which included a vote to place a bond on the November ballot. Uh, and I know we have Superintendent Tom Flanagan, uh, Chairperson Claire Wool, and others who are here uh, to speak to this item. Um, We've allotted, uh, we've allotted about 15 minutes for this, so if you could sort of split the difference with us and uh, give us a brief update, which we are anxiously awaiting, and uh, then we'll go to counselor questions and comments. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much for having us. I hope it's okay if we brought a couple of our, members of our new members of our team up who you, well, they're not new members of our team, but members of our team you haven't seen up here. And certainly okay. if you want to introduce them, that would be that. great. Yes. Um, so thank you so much uh, for having us tonight, President Paul and City Council. We appreciate the opportunity to be here, and we um, are really grateful for your partnership throughout this process to, to all of you, so thank you. Um, we are joined tonight by Joe Wythe, our project manager from White and & and Jesse Beck, um, from Freeman French Freeman and Joe and Jesse have been key to the to the uh, project thus far and will continue with us uh, throughout the project as well as Chairperson Wool um, is here and so we'll move through we will we'll each take a couple of um, or a couple of us will take a few points we'll try to move uh, relatively quickly but not too fast um, and um, save time at the end for, for questions and discussion. So we're, gonna, we're planning to update you on the MOU, uh, on our engagement efforts, on the financials, on the environmental work, and permitting, uh, and the timeline. Um, we, there are three documents attached. Um, th it's the September 6th NPA presentation. That's actually a presentation, an NPA presentation that we're giving at all the MPAs, so we've taken off the September 6th. Uh, but the rest of the presentation is the same as we're giving to all of the MPA, uh, all the MPAs. Uh, we also have the September 6th board uh, memo to the school board, so you can see the information that we provided to the school board. That memo has a, has a number of links that many of them take you to our website and the landing page of our website. We are continuing to refresh with updated information about the project. Um, and... Um, 
and then we have our memo to to the city to you all, um, and those are those are our three documents. Um, first, the MOU, uh, the school board approved uh, on September sixth, uh, and Chairperson Wool signed the MOU uh, late last week. So we're in the process of uh, moving moving that forward. We again appreciate the the collaboration and partnership of the mayor, Mayor Weinberger, and and City Council uh, throughout that process. And um, so that's uh, an important step for us to document and to be clear on the, the way that we will work together through this process. One of those, one of those um, uh, stipulations is that we are coming to you at regular, with some regularity, this being one of those times. Um, so that's the MOU. We are continuing to, to fundraise actively. Um, we told you about our partnership with the Burlington Students Foundation. Uh, we have received uh, f about $50,000 in donations to the Burlington Student Foundation uh, at this point. I think that's just a start for us with private philanthropy. Um, and we're going to continue to do that work. That really is just getting started. Uh, we're also pursuing, uh, similar to last time, multiple existing appropriations and grants in the FY23 budgets, both federal and, and state budgets. Um, I think I, it feels like we're gaining traction in many of those um, in, in, in a couple of a couple of areas, uh, and so I think we'll start to see that we will be eligible for some funding for uh, to support this project, whether it be uh, so. And, and there can be a number of different places where that could that could happen. Uh, in addition to that, we're gearing up for FY24, the FY24 legislative session. So we're going to continue to work with Leonine Public Affairs and uh, Maggie Lentz, and she's um, gonna, is helping us with our strategy on, on preparing for the FY24 legislative cycle. So uh, we're gonna continue to, to work aggressively uh, in, in that area. Um, and with that, I'm gonna pass it over to, and the financials haven't changed from the original uh, conversation. So those finan the financials are still are on the uh, presentation, the MPA presentation and those haven't changed significantly, but we are, um, we have committed to um, doing as much as we can so that we don't, do not have to borrow the full uh, $165 million, uh, that we are asking voters to approve on November 8th uh, if they were to approve that. And so we are truly committed to that. We already have 50,000. 50, uh, that's a little in, in many ways, but also a lot if you think about philanthropy in the first month of our of our, of our kind of work with Burlington Students Foundation and, and getting that really uh, running. So, feeling good about that. With that, I'm gonna pass it to Jesse um, uh, to talk about architecture and engineering design update. Sure, good evening. Uh, we're proceeding on into the next phase of design from schematic design into design development. So that allows the engineers to fully integrate into the team we have, uh, we're keeping horizons and on top in the locations that they are, so they've been removed from the floor plans that are in your report. And that's helped us reduce the square footage to around 250,000 square feet. So as we work along through the building process, we're finding ways to tighten up the design, uh, try to work towards reducing costs as we go uh, while keeping the quality strong. The uh, sustainability aspects are now becoming more clear as we get more detail and engineering into the project. Um, we are on a path to a, a high lead rating, silver or gold. We are looking at a path to net zero with the addition of uh, PV systems and working with a third party to try to play that out. Um, the good news on the sustainability front is that we're starting to work with BED in Vermont Gas, and we have a schedule of values uh, for incentives uh, of around 200 to $400,000. So there's some good savings that we can achieve as we work through that path to net zero. Um, we have uh, bid the construction manager role for pre-construction services and post-construction. Uh, the bid was awarded to Whiting Turner, who was the low bidder. And the good news is that our cost estimating that we've done to date by both uh, independent cost estimators 
uh, the bid was under those numbers. So we're tracking very well. Um, <coughs> you'll see some renderings in your packet. So we're starting to go into uh, MPAs and public sessions with some more, uh, you know, building aesthetic information. So that's my report. Thank you, Jesse. And we'll pass it to Joe to talk about the environmental work and permitting. So just to back up this, I want to make sure that everyone is aware. Uh, so the, our environmental consultants and district representatives have been meeting on a monthly basis with Vermont uh, Department of Envir Environmental Conservation and also EPA uh, for the last couple of years since the school was closed down. So that communication uh, with the regulators uh, has been continu continuing and will continue uh, in the coming months. Uh, site investigation reports for building materials and soils have been submitted and reviewed by the regulatory agencies, and the team is now in the process of preparing a building materials corrective action plan, or CAP, and is shooting to have that submitted and approved by Vermont DEC and EPA by mid-November. Uh, simultaneously with that, the environmental team is also preparing a demo and abatement big package with a target of awarding uh, that package to a, an abatement contractor uh, also in mid-November. So that would be right after the cap is officially approved. And uh, assuming we're able to keep this timeline going, uh, this will allow for demo and abatement to commence as early as late December or early January. Uh, regarding permitting, we have begun the local permitting process. Uh, we met uh, with the Technical Review Committee several weeks ago. We've met with a couple NPAs, and uh, we also presented the sketch plan application to the DRB a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the design team is currently uh, working on plans and supporting documents uh, to get them to a level where we can submit the a COA level two zoning permit application at the end of this month, so by September 30th. And our, you know, our goal is to get that submitted on the 30th and we're projecting to have DRB approval by the end of November. Uh, one item that I believe Superintendent Flanagan wants to discuss or at least raise tonight is the issue of the zoning permit fees and development review fees. Uh, those fees total about $165,000 for this project, which we will be required to submit at the end of this month when we submit that, that zoning application. Um, so I think you wanted to maybe talk about some opportunities for potential waivers. <laughs> I am done. Thank you, Joe. Yeah, so I think um, for discussion later, we, we would like to make a formal request um, to waive the permitting fees that uh, Joe just mentioned. Um, and so we can, we can discuss that. And, and lastly, I just wanted to give a sense of the engagement uh, timeline. So our engagement timeline, we, we are in MPA season. Uh, we're doing two this week. We did one or two last week. We're, we're doing, uh, making sure we're getting out to, to the MPAs. We have two town halls. September 21st is the first one. October 19th is the second. Um, Mail-in ballots on the 26th for a vote on November 8th. And um, demo is scheduled to begin January 2023, assuming, hoping that the, the voters approve um, the, the bond. So at that point, at, with that, I'll leave it for discussion. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. Uh, are there questions or comments from the council? on this update, um, and then perhaps we'll go to the administration after. I'll, I'm looking online to see if there's anyone with a hand up. Doesn't appear to be the case right now. Um, Councilor Travers. Thank you, President Paul, and, and thank you all again for that presentation. It's nice to have you back, and it's great to hear uh, the efforts that you've undertaken and the progress you've made, so thanks very much to that. Um, the. Uh, one point that you just mentioned there that sits heaviest with me is that uh, ballots are being mailed to voters two weeks from today. 
and folks will have an opportunity here in Burlington not that long from now to begin uh, voting on this item. So uh, I appreciate your all's efforts to be out there and engaged. Um, it's a reminder to me uh, as a big supporter of this project, it's something that I think is completely necessary for our city to continue to thrive, uh, that uh, I need to, uh, wearing my counselor hat, be out there and engage in the community a bit more. And I suppose if this is a call to action to my colleagues here on the council as well, as, uh, as well as any folks uh, who are tuning into this meeting who are interested in seeing this project through, uh, that now is the time for us to be out there and to be engaging with neighbors and to supporting this, uh, given that uh, again, folks will have an opportunity to vote on it just two weeks from today. Uh, so thank you, and, and I'm looking forward to getting out there in the coming weeks and months. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, are there other councillors with either questions or comments um, on the presentation or questions that you have of the school leadership? Uh, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul, and thank you for the update. Um, just following up on what Councillor Travers said, if there are engagement opportunities, if you could let all of us know how we can be helpful to you. That would be, that would be good. Yes. That was my responsibility tonight to uh, inform you. Tomorrow night, uh, September 13th, we have our BHS open house. Uh, for the first time in three years, we'll be inviting all four grades and parents, families, guardians to BHS. Now we know BHS, uh, the students currently there, the ninth graders, would be 12th graders at the opening of the new school. So we will also be attending um, the middle school, uh, Edmonds and Hunt as well. But tomorrow night is our kickoff night to our internal community, uh, high school, and um, signing families, uh, guardians, like I said, up and students uh, to help us in this campaign. We plan to kick off this campaign on September 21st with the open house uh, where we'll inform the public uh, as well as um, engage yourself via email with an invitation um, to um, go to door to door with us with printed materials. This is a grassroots effort on behalf of the 12 school board members present uh, and online tonight as well as the 12 city councilors and mayor um, because we know district leadership cannot be part of that campaign. So yes, the answer is you will receive an email from myself uh, and the entire board inviting you to these public engagement events as well as, well as honk and waves. Um, we have an entire campaign timeline and signs that will be distributed um, shortly in the coming weeks. So thank you for your offer of support um, and we appreciate um, that greatly. Thank you. Well, we all love a good honk and wave. <laughs> uh, thank you, Councillor Barlow. Um, were there any, uh, Mayor Weinberger? Thank you, President Paul. Um, I'll just uh, add a couple quick things. Um, uh, in addition to these great events, just heard from, uh, from, from Claire, um, people who want to come and talk to uh, Tom uh, about the uh, project, ask questions, are welcome to come to the bagel this Wednesday uh, at eight, 8 in the morning. The coffee that I have every week out there is going to be dedicated to uh, to the project this week. I think it's a good example to, to talk directly um, uh, uh, about the project. And um, I uh, uh, just, uh, I'm really excited to hear that the, the campaign is, is uh, taking shape and planned out and, and uh, echoing uh, Councillor Travers's uh, points. Um, I, I do, um, certainly I, I, I want to be a resource for you and do anything I can to help with the campaign. And uh, I think if you look back on some of the key ballot items we've had together over the last decade, <clears throat> um, they're being concerted, organized uh, effort um, between the council and the administration to make the support clear um, uh, has been important and um, look forward to partnering with you that in, in, the, in the weeks just ahead as uh, Councillor Travers points out. So, uh, thanks for the, being back here and giving this update and uh, I look forward to, um, uh, we'll say, the, the, moment, the fundraising effort and the conversations with Montpelier figures, the momentum that is, is picking up and I'm going to be attending, uh, maybe virtually, uh, but somehow joining in a meeting later this week with a, a state commissioner. And uh, I, you know, appreciate and, and 
see that the effort is uh, starting to get get some momentum and look forward to working to, to support you there as, as we've committed in the uh, in the MOU. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, seeing no other comments, uh, we'll look forward to our, the next update and to the public engagement opportunity. I'm sorry. Uh, oh, uh, Councilor House, I'm sorry. Please go ahead. Hi, yes, sorry, my um, computer's been a bit wonky. Um, thank you, President Paul. Um, yeah, I just, I also want to, you know, express my, my support for this. Um, and I really, um, kind of think of our school system almost like preventative medicine. You know, we, we talk so much about, um, you know, issues facing our community and challenges, you know, such as addiction, crime, all of these things. And schools really can be a mitigating factor to this. And students through this project are going to feel such a sense of pride, such a sense of um, belonging. And so this is a an incredibly important um, project. Um, and yeah, thank you, Councillor Travers, for that for that call to action. Um, I could not agree more. Thank you, thanks, Councillor House. Uh, if there aren't others, and it doesn't it doesn't appear that there are other councillors who have comments and questions, uh, we'll look forward to the next update um, and the community engagement opportunities that you've laid out for us. Um, and in the meantime, uh, just want to again express our collective enthusiastic support for the project, um, and thank you for being here. Um, seeing no objection, we'll place the informational and presentation items that you provided on file with our thanks um, and uh, look forward to our next update from you. Thank you again for being here. We'll move on to seven, item 7.06, which is a security camera system update and expansion. Uh, for this item, we have CIO uh, Scott Barker with us, who can give us a brief overview on this. Um, welcome once again, and thanks for thanks for hanging out with us for a little while between this and uh, the work session. Before we go to a brief overview of the item, I'll look to Councillor Travers for a motion on this item. I move to approve and authorize the Chief Innovation Officer to execute execute a contract with Royal Group in an amount not to exceed $425,000 to purchase the FLIR security camera system and all necessary server equipment from Royal Group subject to final review and approval by the city attorney's office. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, we have a motion and a second, seconded by uh, Councillor Carpenter. Um, thank you very much, Councillor Carpenter. Um, CIO Barker, if you could, we did discuss it at the Board of Finance, but if you could certainly give us a brief overview and then also the um, memo that you did submit to us um, later in the afternoon, if you could, um, if you could summarize those, those items as well. Sure. So Thank in you. summary, the, the, the quick rundown of this, of this is that the current security camera system software and servers are end of life, out of date, and need to be updated so that we can continue to meet the needs of the city and across uh, any of the buildings, public spaces, things like that, where we have security cameras. Um, the, uh, the, the system is built out um, on, in two, two pieces. One is the software and the servers that is uh, designed to run the security camera systems. And then there is uh, money in the quote as well or in the proposal to buy an additional uh, 100 cameras, both for break fix. Uh, we know that there are 12 to 15 cameras that are not working right now that we need to replace right away. We also know that there's 15 to 20 that we know that we need to add in certain areas. And then the rest of it, as any of you have paid attention to supply chain issues in the technology world, as well as grocery stores and other places, trying to make sure that we can, as we can get them, we can get them in and have them available for down the road. Um, I am kind of at a, let me see if I can find my memo that I sent later in the day. To give a quick summary of that. It, it basically boils down to we have, we've priced the, or we've, we've sized the servers 
even though the system itself, the software itself can, can carry up to 600 cameras, we don't have any intention of doing that anytime soon, and it's not intended to expand like that. In fact, we've only built the servers out in that proposal to cover about 280 cameras. We do know there is some growth that we need to have over the course of the next two to, th two to three years. This system is designed um, to be ready to go for five to seven years with um, the typical security and uh, coverage that you would expect on anything like this. It is not a true monitoring system as much as it is everything goes through dispatch and it's, it, it can be used for uh, gathering information after, after an incident where we can try to identify people and places, et cetera. So this is not something that anyone outside of the police dispatch has uh, availability or access to. It's, as I was mentioning earlier, it's ironically one of the few systems in the city that we propose, purchase, help install, and then never get to touch again. Um, we don't have admin privileges. We don't have even uh, regular privileges on that system. It's all through police dispatch. Thank you, thanks for that overview. Uh, we'll go to questions or comments from the council. Um, and actually, Councilor Travers, did you want the floor back after? No, okay. So um, if there are councilors who have questions, um, now would be the time. Councilor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. And thank you, uh, Scott, for sticking around um, and for fielding the questions that I I had over the weekend. No problem. Um, I will be voting no on this uh, as it's proposed tonight, as I discussed at the Board of Finance. Uh, it's not that I don't understand that the system is at end of life and that these upgrades need to be made in order for the cameras we currently have to continue operating, or that, um, <clears throat> and I also understand that there are a select few areas that would benefit from having new security cameras. Um, the concerns that I have uh, relate mostly to the scope and the scale of uh, these uh, updates. And uh, I have serious concerns about the initial purchase of 100 cameras, um, as well as uh, concerns about the potential capacity of this system to hold up to 600 cameras um, if we were to go to the full uh, capacity that is allowed under these upgrades. Um, without seeing the policy that is used for camera deployment, without seeing the policy connected to um, how the video captured is used, I can't support this item tonight. So uh, I will leave it there for now. Thank you, Councillor McGee. We'll go to Councillor Hightower, and then if there are others, um, please raise your hand. I have similar concerns as to what um, Councillor McGee just said. Um, I think especially around the policy, I don't necessarily disagree with the five-year plan or even with having the um, extra cameras on hand for when things break down. Um, I do think that spending another half a million on a security system when I haven't seen how we're gonna use that or don't have enough information, which is no fault of Scott's um, in any way, shape, or form. He gave us so much information before this meeting, but I think I would need to see a policy. I guess my ask is that the administration, and I know that individual counselors aren't supposed to ask for things, but that public safety committee would do some review, the administration would give some presentation of how, what our actual policy is on these cameras, because I think right now, if a constituent came to me and asked like, oh, my property was stolen, can we use those cameras to retrieve it? I don't even know the answer to that. Um, so yeah, I think I want a better understanding of what level of crime this is used for um, and how we use it and how we grow the program, if at all, and what that decision making looks like before I can approve this. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hightower. We'll go to Councillor Barlow and then Councillor Bergman. Uh, thanks, President Paul. Um, I had a question about, you said that the cameras aren't, um, they're not monitored, they're just used after the fact by dispatch to, um, to see if, you know, if there's additional um, evidence, I guess, about incidents that happen. What's the retention policy on the video? 
Today, my understanding is that dispatch keeps it for 90 days. 90 days. And the other, the other concern I had was that in your memo from this afternoon, um, it says that the cost will increase by 15 to 20% if we don't act by September 17th. That is correct. So that's even before our next meeting. Um, and, for, you know, I just did the quick math. It's on the $425,000 that you were asking for. That's somewhere between $63,750 and $85,000 more than what if we execute the, a contract with the vendor before that. Is that correct? It is not an insignificant amount of increase, correct? Okay. Well, yeah. I'm, I am, I'm supportive of this, and um, I will be voting yes tonight. Thank you, thank you, Councillor Barlow. We'll go to Councillor Bergman. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, I share the concerns that my colleagues uh, McGee and Hightower have expressed, but I, I do think that um, the cost increase is significant and it is uh, worth our going forward. I would like to see a presentation by the administration on the policies on the way that this is gonna fit into the uh, big public safety strategy that we have and uh, uh, be able to explain all of that to, uh, uh, to the public as well, to make this a public presentation. I think the people of Burlington uh, deserve to hear that um, and, um, and feel assured um, by the public presentation uh, that uh, the privacy concerns that people uh, may have um, are going to uh, not be um, real concerns. So I, I hope that we will do that. Um, I am uh, voting in favor of this on the expectation that the administration will, um, will have that, um, that public session so that the people can get the best of all worlds, the savings and the, uh, the extra security uh, and all the information that they need to know that uh, Big Brother is not there. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Um, thank you, President Paul. Uh, thank you for doing the work on this and um, helping us advance our, our public safety in this way. We don't have all the tools that we would like to have to um, provide the public safety that our residents expect. And we hear that on a daily basis from our residents. I see this as something that can fill in our gaps. And while in general I have privacy concerns, I don't really have privacy concerns about this. I think that um, Big Brother is out there and Big Brother is all of us. It's every one of us running around out there with cell phones that can record what everybody in the public space is doing and publish it on social media and people do on a regular basis. I don't think that the city should, um, we actually also feel it's very important that all of our police officers um, wear these cameras, that they turn them on when they're interacting with the public. And so it seems to me um, not to really be balanced to prohibit us from having cameras that maybe can record an incident before the police officers arrive. Um, many communities all over the country have live cams where everybody can view the cameras all the time. So we can all view it. I think it's important that people know we have cameras out there, but I do think we all know there are cameras out there all over our neighborhoods. Um, I am not really concerned with the numbers. You know, if we're talking about putting cameras in City Hall Park, whether we put two or 20 or 100 in City Hall Park, I think we are um, trying to provide some accountability and public safety. I would be all for putting cameras on every bike rack in the city at this point. Um, we're getting complaints about gardeners in Callahan Park who don't feel, feel safe. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunities to, um, you know, to 
record what's happening, to potentially hold people accountable. Um, and certainly, when we're talking about the gunfire incidents, the violent crime that is rapidly escalating in our community, sadly, these are tools that can give victims, families, closure when the worst thing you can imagine happens, and it's been happening here to our community members. Um, I want to know that the city is doing all that we can to solve those kinds of crimes, and I think that the cameras give us a lot of opportunity, and there was a day when that wasn't true, you know, that we were concerned about even putting cameras on the, on the stoplights, um, because not everybody had one in their pocket. But in a day where everyone has one in their pocket, I think the public expects that. There isn't a right to privacy in the public space. We're not talking about peering into people's windows, though I do think there should be a policy that we don't do that. And so I agree, let's find out what the policy is, let's have some parameters around that. But I do have confidence that that's not what we're looking to do here. Um, so uh, thank you, and I hope that the, the council will in support this investment in public safety. It's, it's one of the things that we can do. We can't do all the things that we would like to do at this point. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. Uh, we'll go to Councillor House. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I think um, what, I, what I have to add to this debate is that um, inequity and, and bias, whether conscious um, or unconscious, um, is pervasive and it's a systemic issue. And we know historically um, that, you know, our government has, you know, whether it's intentional or unintentional, um, created policies that are, are biased and that disproportionately impact people um, with marginalized identities. And um, I do, you know, feel, feel concerned moving forward with this um, without um, fully understanding um, how and and where these cameras will will be used? I think I think with great power comes great responsibility, as as cliche as that is. Um, and so I I really call on um, the administration to um, come forward with a plan for how they intend to um, use this surveillance. I you know I I hear the public safety concerns that are out there. You know I um, you know feel some of them, I, you know, myself, I think. Um, but, you know, I, I want to know how how this technology is is going to be used. Um, so help, you know, help me understand that. And, um, you know, I, I understand that we, um, we need a new security system, we need an upgrade, but um, I'd really like to know how that technology is going to, to be used. Uh, thank you, Councillor House. Uh, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I just want to note that at the Board of Finance, I did express an interest in supporting a version of this contract that would allow for us to upgrade the current security system, which uh, with the, the software and the servers, um, which is the part of the contract where we're seeing the increase on September 17th. So I just want to be clear about that, that that is not connected to the number of cameras and that my hope was that we could separate out the conversation about the cameras to a later date. Um, I think, you know, additionally to Councillor Shannon's point, the video that we can all have in our pocket isn't funneled directly to police dispatch. So to the extent that that could potentially be used uh, against somebody, uh, I think there are barriers to uh, police accessing that. Um, and I just want to challenge the notion that more security cameras lead to more safety. I think we have spent a lot of time in this room talking about uh, measures that are reactive, that are responding to crime, 
uh, we haven't had nearly enough conversations in this room about preventing crime. Uh, and so I would like to see some of the money that is maybe going towards this contract. I know it wouldn't come from uh, the IT budget, but I think the, the point is, is true that we need to invest more in prevention than we are right now, and we need to have that conversation um, more explicitly. So, thank you. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Uh, not seeing any other comments from, the, oh, uh, Mayor Weinberger. <clears throat> thank you, President Paul. Um, uh, I wanted to say thank you to Scott for um, uh, in another area, and I think you're making a habit out of this, um, uh, identifying um, an area uh, where we need to act uh, to uh, address a, a real a gap in our IT infrastructure, and thank you for moving uh, swiftly um, to, to bring a, a plan forward that uh, <clears throat> you know addresses a concerning situation where this um, system that we have relied on for years um, needs investment or uh, could be could be compromised and um, I appreciate Councilor Bergman that um, the uh, uh, that you the the comfort you'd expressed in in, in moving forward um, while still having some uh, questions that I think are, are fair questions you know we we have um, over time, uh, discussed uh, and um, made decisions uh, at this table, you know, largely, you know, some of these years ago before many of the current members. But, you know, over time, the city's um, uh, uh, use of cameras has expanded, and um, I think uh, I, I will make good on the idea that we should find a way to have, have that, that discussion and have the parts of it at least that, that can be public, public. I think there may be elements of it that, um, you know, uh, questions that would be legitimate for counselors to have that you might, that maybe would be best handled in some kind of uh, privileged um, uh, communication as we do with um, a number of security conversations. Um, and, uh, but I, I very much appreciate um, not, uh, <clears throat> um, making this necessary decision subject to hashing out um, at this stage uh, some uh, you know, new or expanded uh, policy. Um, I think we can have that conversation and see what, what additional policy work uh, seem, seems appropriate and needed. So I appreciate the spirit of finding a way to get this done tonight. Um, in terms, you know, one thing that will be in that presentation, and it's very, I think these cameras serve a number of different roles. They serve some deterrent roles. Certainly, uh, one of the ways that we, um, uh, that I think many members of the public feel much safer in our garages, knowing that there are a lot of cameras in our public garages, which is, you know, w w uh, makes up a large component of the existing uh, camera infrastructure. It's an area where the public. Uh, you know, there's long been concerns about the, the, the safety and the, the, the sense of safety in, in those uh, facilities and just having the cameras there um, uh, does uh, improve some of that. Um, we, another way we use these, and it's, we, you know, it's just a, it is coincidental but notable that we're having this debate um, a week after we, uh, the Burlington Police Department quickly solved um, uh, the homicide from a couple weeks ago. And um, if you read the affidavit or talk, look, <coughs> watched the um, press conference that uh, we had last week or, or the media around it, it's very clear that the security cameras played a critical role in being able to reconstruct events that, that led up to that homicide. And uh, so these are, these are important tools. I welcome that it seems we have a way forward and happy to keep the conversation going about, about where this, uh, where our use of these tools goes in the future. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, Councillor Hansen, and then we'll try to go to a vote from there. Thanks. Um, I'm just hoping, because I'm a little confused following this debate, if someone can clarify, is voting yes on this, is that voting to expand the, 
the city's footprint in terms of camera coverage or, or not? That's that's what I'm trying to understand, and that my vote really hinges in on that. So if someone could please clarify, that would be helpful. Yes, of course. Go ahead. I'm sorry about that, President Paul. Um, no, I th believe this this proposal is strictly about do we go forward with replacing the system, replacing the server, replacing the software, and then um, buying the extra cameras. There's no, there's nothing in this proposal that talks about expansion beyond very specific places. Um, that have needed them for some period of time. This, this is not about a general expansion of 100 cameras. Okay, so it, it expands the stock, but it doesn't expand the deployment. Correct, that... it, expands, it expands potential stock, but not active. Okay, that's helpful, thank you. Okay, great, thank you, Councilor Hansen. Um, seeing no other comments or questions, um, so just to get back to the motion, the motion has been made and seconded, and this is to approve and authorize the Chief, Administ um, Chief Innovation, Innovative, Innovation Officer to execute a contract with Royal Group and to purchase the FLIR security camera system um, as, um, as identified in the motion. Um, it appears as though it might be best if we go to a roll call vote on this. Um, if the clerk could call the roll, please. Councillor Barlow? Yes. Councillor Bergman? Yes. Councillor Carpenter? Yes. Councillor Jang? Yes. Councillor Freeman? No. Councillor Hansen? Yes. No. Councillor Hightower? No. Councillor House? No. no. Councillor McGee? No. Councillor Shannon? Yes. Councillor Traverse? Yes. City Council President Paul? Yes. Eight ayes, four nays. Uh, the motion passes. And we will, and thank you very much uh, to uh, Scott. Thanks for being here okay. and for your work on this. Um, the next item on our agenda. Um, and we will move on to item 7.07, .07, which is a resolution regarding rank choice voting in mayoral elections. And I'll come to uh, Councillor Hansen for a motion on this item, please. Um, I'll move that we waive the reading and refer the resolution to the Charter Change Committee with a request that the committee returns the resolution to the full council by our October 24th, 2022 meeting. Uh, did you want the floor back after a second? Sure. Okay. Yeah, thank please. Great. Thank you. And that would be seconded by Councillor McGee. So uh, we'll go back to you, Councillor Hanson. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks. I don't have a lot. To, I think we've, hopefully we all understand this issue. We've been debating it for years now. Um, and, you know, we've, we've had a public vote on the issue. Um, that public vote was limited to council elections. I think all the reasons that we, that the council advanced this to voters um, for council elections are also true of mayoral elections as well. Um, and I, I, I think at, at seven of us previously supported that, um, t you know, taking that action, it was vetoed. We didn't end up moving that forward, but I think we still, now, you know, since in the intervening time, we've gotten to see where voters are at on this issue and saw strong approval from voters. Um, so I think it's, we should give them the opportunity to expand this system if they, if they so choose, it'll be up to them. But I think they've shown a preference for ranked choice voting. And um, I think we should give them the chance to expand that system further. Um, it's, we learned from the first iteration that, well, I mean, we already knew this. It takes a long time for a charter change to work its way through the, the legislature and for us to be able to use it. Um, so I think getting the ball rolling is, is important and, and getting this um, to the voters. So there would be some opportunity for the, the charter change committee to look at this over the next month, you know, month plus. Um, but ideally, the goal would be to get this on the, 
the March 2023 ballot. Thank you. I, I'm a little disappointed that the legislature wasn't, uh, it was COVID and I do understand why the legislature wasn't able to move forward with our previous charter change more quickly so that we could have had that in place. People could have used it. We could have then moved on to consider um, whether or not to implement it in the mayoral election. And with this timeline, we're not going to have that kind of opportunity. but. I, as, as we approach our next mayoral election, I just really didn't want to be put in the position again of discouraging some people to vote because, uh, not, I'm sorry, not discouraging people to vote, but discouraging people from running based on the spoiler effect, which we're particularly vulnerable to in Burlington. And I, I think that we tend to look at these voting systems as to, you know, did it, did it produce a result that we, that we liked? Under the current system, we have produced many results that I personally have not liked. Um, that's probably true for everybody at the table. I don't blame the voting system. I hate to say it, I do blame the voters sometimes, but I don't blame the voting system. Uh, any voting system can deliver to us results we like, results we don't like. It's going to evolve with time, whether it favors one party or another party, whatever system that we use. And I think that what we really want to look for is a voting system that best, um, best serves democracy, uh, that engages the public, and that produces a result that is reflective of the, of the voters' will. And for that reason, I, I know that many people I respect disagree with me, but I will continue to support ranked choice voting and hope this council is able to move that forward. Thank you. Thanks, Councilor Shannon. Um, any other councilors? Uh, Councilor Barlow. Oh. Um, thank you, President Paul. Um, I was under the understanding that we would try RCV on the council elections and then review how it worked before we expanded it to, um, to other elections. And we haven't done that yet. And just for that very simple reason, I'm, I'm not supporting this tonight. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. We'll go now to Councillor Hightower. Um, I just have a question for Councillor Hansen, if that's okay, which... Um is that we didn't extend this to school board members. And I wonder, just because with this, we're doing city councilors and the mayor, why we didn't want to do all of the local local offices. Sure, I, I do want to do all the local offices. Um, this was based on what I thought was going to find the most support among other councilors. But for me personally, I would prefer to to include the, the school commission in this. Great, then I guess just a comment as this goes to charter change, I wonder if that's something you all could discuss because I wonder, not that I necessarily think we will have the most competitive races for school board, but I think the logic that we're using for mayors and city councilors also applies to school board. So I don't know why we would leave, why we would leave them out of it at this point. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hightower. Uh, seeing no other comments, 
Um, we have a motion which was seconded and we can go to a vote. Um, and keeping in mind that the uh, recommended, the action is to waive the reading and refer the resolution to the Charter Change Committee with a request that the committee returns the resolution to the full council by our meeting on October 24th. Um, with that said, uh, we can go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, uh, please say aye. 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 And, all the, and all those opposed, please say no. No. All right, so that motion passes uh, 10 to two. Which brings us to uh, item 7.08, a presentation of the annual report of the Burlington Police Commission. And I believe that one of the co-chairs of the commission, uh, Commissioner Gamash, is joining us by Zoom. Um, and I think you were able to find him. And so we'll bring him up on the screen and uh, Um, I can certainly give me just a moment. I'll I'll text him and ask. Well, just in the interest of time, we could, um, I have not received a response from that text, and uh, we'll see whether or not that is, it doesn't, does that person not have their microphone, um, they're still on mute? Okay. No, that, that, yeah, they're, they're, they're still on mute, and you've tried, you've been able, yeah. Um, okay, well. Uh, hopefully they'll respond by uh, by text, um, and I don't know if that I don't know if that's him. Um, so why don't we why don't we move on to um, in the hopes that we get a response? We'll move on to the next item and then come back to 7.08. The next item is 7.09, which is a communication, a request to execute a ground lease agreement with Beta Technologies in the so-called Valley. West Valley of the Burlington International Airport. Um, before we get to the communication from Nick Longo, the Acting Director of Aviation, um, I would, will have a motion on the ground lease agreement and with that I'll go to Councilor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. I move to authorize the leasing of certain identified space at the Burlington International Airport to Beta Technologies, Inc and to authorize the mayor of Burlington to execute the ground lease agreement subject to final review and approval by the city attorney's office. Thank you, Councilor Shannon, for that motion. Is there a second to that motion? Um, Councilor, uh, Councilor Jang, uh, thank you very much. Um, and with that, we'll go to Nick Longo, who can, we did discuss this uh, fairly extensively at the Board of Finance, and if you could perhaps give us uh, that uh, that overview, and as well, I noticed that uh, Jeff Glassberg is also joining us by Zoom. Perfect, absolutely. Thank you, Council President. 
Um, uh, again, we're uh, talking about beta technologies. This is a separate and distinct location at the airport. Uh, this is a much smaller location and a uh, site that Beta Technologies is looking to develop and build a approximate 25,000 square foot hangar on uh, what we call the Valley West apron. Uh, this is a currently vacant uh, apron that was built with federal funding uh, some time ago. And uh, we're very excited to see Beta as a respondent to our uh, public process uh, uh, over the last few years. Uh, we also have received communications from the school district associated with the, with the uh, technical center uh, for the various programs that they have identified. Um, and we have specifically identified those uh, uses and, and physical locations separate from this lease, meaning that we withdrew slight uh, location from the beta lease to, to make sure that we are prepared for any future use on that particular uh, apron. Uh, there also is, this is a 30 year initial lease with the option for two essentially 10 year leases, a 10 and, a, and a just shy of a 10 year lease. Uh, if Beta Technologies meets the specific milestones of development, which is of course the phase two portion of this building, uh, which is an additional 60,000 square foot. Uh, space, another investment on that particular location in which they will be granted the additional two 10-year option agreements. Uh, um, there is no uh, rent credit, unlike the larger lease that we just approved uh, with Beta Technologies. Rent essentially starts upon receiving the certificate of occupancy. Uh, and uh, once again, we're very excited to see that, that apron and uh, additional development by Beta Technologies, uh, which will be the primary use as a culture and educational facility, as well as to store their new electric aircraft. Uh, online, I do have uh, Shelby Lozier, the Director of Ground Transportation, as well as Jeff Glassberg, um, if there are any questions. Uh, thank you, Nick, um, as well. Yes, I did wanna, glad, thank you for acknowledging that uh, you've got Shelby with you as well. Um, are there questions, or actually, I don't know if either Shelby or Jeff, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this? Or, and I also see Jeremy Farkas as well. I'm happy to add a few comments just to reinforce Nick's points. Uh, this uh, opportunity takes uh, a currently vacant, undeveloped, non-income producing uh, site and leverages that to uh, permit the investment of capital by others uh, at the airport. It will generate income for the airport and it will support the growth of beta, which uh, as we discussed uh, back in July, uh, when we brought forth the, the larger transaction for their manufacturing facility is really about groundbreaking technology, significant job growth for the region uh, and the multiplier effects of all of that. This is an arm's length market-based transaction. As Nick mentioned, there are no discounts or rent credits associated with this. There's no investment of capital required by the city or the airport. Uh, upon uh, occupancy, it should generate about $60,000 a year in income to the airport, which will grow based on CPI under the terms of the lease. Further under the terms of the lease, we've preserved a footprint adjacent to this leased area sufficient to site the Burlington Technical Center uh, with opportunities for program collaboration among Beta and the Technical Center. Um, in signing this lease, Beta is also committing to providing infrastructure sufficient to serve that adjacent Technical Center. Um, 
the lease also contains um, a provision under which uh, Beta will fund a capital reserve so that when the building reverts to the airport at the end of the lease term, um, it will have been, that building will have been properly maintained and the city could choose to either take over the building at that point or to use the funds in the capital reserve to take the building down if that were its choice. Thank you so much, uh, Jeff, for, for that. Um, were there any, uh, Jeremy or Shelby, did you have anything else that you wanted to add? And then we'll go to questions. No? Okay, thank you very much. Um, are there questions from counselors? Uh, seeing none, then we will, we will go to a vote. Um, a motion has been made and seconded. Um, all those in favor of the motion with regard to executing the ground lease agreement with Beta, Tra Beta Technologies, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say no. Uh, we'll note um, the vote is uh, a, a 10, uh, 10 yes, uh, one who is not present, Councillor House, and one recusal from Councillor Travers. And that motion passes. Um, I was able to get in touch with, uh, regarding um, item 7.08, with uh, Co-Chair Gamash, who unfortunately there was some confusion as to the timing of this presentation, and he is not available to join us um, this evening. With that, um, I would entertain a motion to postpone this item to our meeting on September 19th. And that was that is made by uh, Councillor Jang and seconded by Councillor McGee. Um, this is debatable. Is there anyone who has a comment or question on that? Uh, seeing none, all those in favor of the motion to postpone, please say aye. 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 And any opposed, please say no. That motion passes. Um, thank you very much for, for doing that. Um, which brings us to the end of our deliberative agenda. And uh, we find ourselves with the good fortune of it being 10 o'clock and being able to complete our agenda. Um, and that brings us to item eight, committee reports. Are there counselors who have committee reports? Councilor Barlow. This is my first committee report. Oh, how exciting. Um, the Tax Abatement Committee is having an organizational meeting on Tuesday, September 20th at 5 p.m. in the Green Mountain Conference Room. We'll be discussing our mission statement and reviewing web page content related to tax abatement and to the financial aid programs. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Councillor Hightower. Yes, this is an update as much for the city councilors um, as for the members of the public, which is that CDNR is at least working towards a resolution um, to bring a home share program um, in front of the council um, that is meant to encourage um, more folks to provide affordable housing in exchange for a house share. So we're hoping to bring an incentive program along those lines. Um, potentially from CDNR. So we reviewed a proposal for that or maybe going to look at a resolution for it at our next CDNR meeting, which is tomorrow, and we did not have a CDNR meeting in August. Thank you, Councillor Hightower. Any other committee chairs or others that have a... Councillor Bergman. Uh, so the Charter Change Committee will meet tomorrow night, and uh, we will be continuing to discuss the... Uh, all legal resident uh, voting in non uh, in, in local elections, as well as another item on the siting of polling places. There is a desire, particularly in light of the work going on with redistricting, to uh, consider um, greater flexibility in the um, the siting, the ability to site a polling place that would be in close proximity, but not necessarily within the individual ward. And that is different than the way we do things right now, uh, would require a charter change, in my opinion. And um, 
It um, is something that we've been discussing with ward officials, uh, the, uh, the ward clerks and the ward um, inspectors of election, as well as the uh, Board of Voter Registration and anybody who has uh, attended um, from the public. So um, we'll be doing that tomorrow night and then we will uh, take a couple of weeks off so one member can enjoy themselves uh, uh, for a couple of weeks and then uh, pick up and uh, take on the, uh, the question of uh, ranked choice voting, which I believe it if it was good enough for Sarah Palin, it should be good enough for us. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Councillor Bergman. Um, <laughs> don't know really what to say after that. <laughs> um, are there <laughs> are there are there other councillors with committee reports? Um, if there aren't, then we can move on to item number nine, which is City Council General City Affairs. Are there councillors who wish to give an offer comments on general city affairs. Oh, Councillor McGee. Great. Thank you, President Paul. I just wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize the passing of a constituent of mine and uh, uh, an advocate here in the city, uh, Tony Reddington, who uh, we are all very familiar with. Uh, many, many emails regarding public, uh, excuse me, transportation and uh, public works and especially uh, roundabouts. So I'm hopeful that um, this body can find a way to honor Tony's legacy of uh, advocacy um, uh, and look forward to having conversations about that in the weeks ahead. Thank you, Councillor McGee. Um, any other councillors uh, with general city affairs comments? Um, seeing none, we'll go on to council president updates. I do have one update just to give you a heads up um, on our first meeting in October, which is October 17th. We are going to have a field trip hosted by the Burlington Conservation Board that will happen before the council meeting. Um, they would like to share with us some of the nature-based climate action projects that have been currently launched in the city. And these initiatives include um, tree planting, heat mitigation, stormwater and flood resilience, um, an inclusive nature connection, local ecologically sound food production. Um, and to that end, uh, we're gonna, we will be um, going to two locations in the city, um, one at the Intervale and the other at Champlain Elementary. We haven't worked out all the details, but it appears as though we will start the field trip at 5 p.m. So if you want to mark your calendars for the um, October 17th meeting, we will be starting that meeting um, earlier. Um, with that, that brings us to the final item of the evening, item number 11, which is updates from the mayor, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Just. Uh, one announcement, one thing I'd like to bring people's attention to tonight, could have had this in the climate emergency report, I suppose, but we, this uh, Saturday is the Net Zero Energy Festival at the Burlington Electric Department. Um, uh, they've done events like this in the past. I don't think we've called it a Net Zero Energy Festival before, a supercharged day of family fun. Um, uh, and there's, you know, champ and uh, D DJs and ice cream and, kids games and stuff. There's also um, a real opportunities for uh, Burlingtonians to test drive electric vehicles, test ride e-bikes, um, see demonstrations on heat pumps and solar power options, uh, and get ex expert advice on how, what you can do with your household to move the community closer to the net zero energy goal. There's, this is really an area that um, there's going to be lots of opportunities, even more opportunities in, in the uh, months and years ahead. Go, uh, the Inflation, Inflation Reduction Act that just passed the federal government, as we've mentioned before, um, really 
reinforces what we're trying to do here in Burlington with the uh, move towards electrification. There will be substantial federal incentives uh, around it, especially building improvements. This festival is an opportunity to go and talk to BED experts, talk to others who have made these kind of investments and consider what you might be able to do with your, your home or vehicle. That's it. Thanks, President Powell. Thank you. Thanks, Mayor Weinberger, for that update. Um, that brings us to the end of our agenda. Uh, I would ask for a motion to adjourn. So moved. Uh, from Councillor McGee and seconded by uh, Councillor Councillor Carpenter. Um, all those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. 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 Um, and all those opposed, please say no. Uh, we are adjourned at nine minutes after 10.